I've now been immersed in the debate around climate change for some time. I've been harangued by climate sceptics. I've been pummeled by climate doomsters. And the thing that stood out for me is not so much about what people think about climate change, but how people think about climate change. This video is the first of five on how to think about climate change. My name is Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show for Change Makers. The majority of people seem not to think about climate change. Not really. What they mostly do is what we tend to do for all issues. They absorb the ideas of their preferred peer group and assume that those ideas must be right. Ironically, that applies to those who believe that they follow the science. It also applies to those who believe themselves to be sceptics. Neither of those labels should describe people who simply follow the received wisdom from their own side, when you think about it. So if you realise that maybe that describes you, how do you break out of it? And if you're sure that you're already on the journey to be free from any kind of groupthink, how can you keep pushing yourself not to get lazy and to fall back into it? I've identified five themes under how to think about climate change. Really though, even though some of the items are specific to climate change, they would be translatable to any complex issues with a public policy component. They are 1. Scientific mindset 2. The spirit of the debate 3. Seeing the context clearly 4. Understanding our own limitations and 5. Finding our way to a solution Let's jump straight into part one, scientific mindset. Eight points on the scientific mindset. Point one, the best tool you can have is a sincere dedication to facts and reason and a fearlessness in seeking out the best arguments wherever they may lead. Probably everyone's nodding along to that saying, yeah, I do that already. But do you? Do you really? Most people, when they research a topic, they find out what their favoured spokespeople say about it. They take that as the right position and then they stop there. They don't look for the original data. They don't look for the critical voices on the other side. They don't look at methodologies. They don't seek out the best arguments on both sides or all sides, because sometimes it's more than two. And this has certainly been me in the past. Since it stopped being me, I've changed my mind on a number of issues after closer examination. The true scientific mindset is to be fascinated to know what is the truth. When something you believe to be true, maybe even something that you're quite emotionally invested in, when that gets challenged, you respond with excitement and curiosity. Maybe your old assumptions are about to be challenged. Maybe you're about to learn something new about the world you hadn't even considered, which will bring you that much closer to the truth. That is exciting. And if it doesn't pan out, well, you've gained that much more clarity about the strength of your existing position. But you won't get that if you simply dismiss the challenge defensively and just look for the first answer that comes to hand as to why it's wrong. You only get it with the openness of mind that says this, I form my opinions on what I learn about the actual state of the world. I revise those positions in the light of new information. There are no human beings who find that easy to do. And there are no positions on climate change that are immune to being challenged and updated by new information or stronger arguments. Define yourself as someone who values truth, not someone who is an Extinction Rebellion true believer or a Tony Heller fan. When you see a position, think, that's interesting. I wonder what the available data has to say about that position every time, especially on the positions that you're inclined to support. If you do, you'll never be embarrassed by new information, only interested. Point two, and related to point one, separate out the questions of fact from the question of what needs to be done. One is science, the other is politics or business, maybe. But in the climate change debate, particularly, people often treat them as though they were the same thing. And again, this cuts both ways. The proposition that things might not be as bad as the worst case scenario is a possibility to be explored, not a political argument to be refuted. The proposition there might be a problem that will affect our society is a question of the science. What action needs to be taken as a result is a question of politics. And as such, it doesn't lead to only one place. There are several options for most of these questions. If we're going to survive and thrive together in the world, it will probably be because we take the time to understand the problems that we do or we don't face, 
so that we can respond effectively and proportionately to those problems. Every generation through human history has faced problems, and not one of those problems, I'm willing to guess, was solved by inappropriate levels of complacency. Some of them were, of course, made worse by overreacting, so you still have the task of telling the difference between those two. I didn't say it would be easy. But whenever you start with a preconception about what the solution should be, you're much more inclined to shape your understanding of the problem to inevitably lead to your preferred solution. The chances of you creating unintended negative consequences that way massively go up because it's much more likely you won't perceive the problem correctly. Point three, let's talk about the scientific consensus. Now, some of my commenters get very antsy about any mention of consensus, which is what happens when certain terms get weaponized. But let's break this up into a more granular way than people generally do. Here's the thing. The basic science around climate change, the chemistry and the physics around the fact that the planet is warming and why, that is without question much more reliable than the prediction models or some of the outlier positions relating to catastrophic tipping points. When people talk about the scientific consensus, it relates to the basic science of what is and what is not changing. If you're going to argue with those things, you are in a much more difficult space. The majority of the most credible sceptics don't argue with those building block things. There are lots of assumptions and implications that they think should be challenged, but they don't start by arguing about whether CO2 is or is not a greenhouse gas. I know that some of you will explode at this, but it just isn't that controversial. But the thing that the people on the other side don't realise, or maybe just don't acknowledge, is that the agreement on that point does not apply to every idea or proposition that comes under the heading of climate change. It doesn't apply to the prediction models. Likewise, the ideas that have been put forward about cascading tipping points. There are some perfectly respectable voices arguing for them, but it remains a relatively small group of scientists, and there are many mainstream smart voices saying that the evidence for those tipping points doesn't stack up. We don't start by assuming one side nor the other of those is right. See point number one. But clearly it's a position that doesn't carry a consensus. So people who dispute those things are not so-called deniers. People who insist those things are definitely true, are not following the science. They're speculating. Likewise, on the other side, if you're a strong sceptic, there's not one single thing called climate science, all aspects of which are just wrong. If you take either of those views, you're following a tribe, not looking objectively at the evidence. Point four, let's talk about research. And specifically, let's talk about peer-reviewed research. Some people see it as the gold standard. If you can find the peer-reviewed research, then you've found the truth. Others see it as a discredited system. Let's take each of those in turn. Firstly, self-evidently, scientific studies are not ever to be treated as perfect final statements of the truth. Why? Because it's carried out by human beings. Since scientists are human, you would expect lots of peer-reviewed studies to have flaws. There are, across all the different academic disciplines, 2.5 million peer-reviewed papers published annually worldwide. What does and doesn't get passed by peer review isn't consistent by all the available evidence. And often that inconsistency can be random human variation. One reviewer will wave something through, another will look for fault and to bring it down. And that's just one reason why you can't assume that peer reviewed research equals truth. As a result of that inconsistency, you can usually find at least one published paper to support any outlier position on any scientific question. Things don't get to become settled another loaded phrase, unless numerous pieces of research have been carried out we look at numerous different related matters through different lenses and find that the evidence all points in the same direction. That's both its strength and its weakness. The strength is that facts that gain accumulating weights of solid evidence to support them will be strengthened by the knowledge behind the peer group to help it stand apart from the noise of less well-supported theories. But that can also be its weakness in that by definition, the peer review system militates against research that bucks a trend or overturns an accepted wisdom. Now, every discontent will claim that the second of those applies to their work. It's a rare gem where that actually turns out to be the case. 
The rarity of the situation makes the tendency all the more important though. It's one thing to see that the peer review process has flaws, but it's another to conclude that those flaws render it completely without value, which is what some people do when their preferred perspective isn't represented in the way that they would like it to be in the literature. A recent study showed that the quality of papers was improved by peer review. Doesn't mean that those papers therefore can automatically be taken as truth. Everything, even published research, should be reconsidered as new evidence and new arguments come to light. However, peer review as a process has certainly come under more sustained attack recently. Particularly in the social sciences, there have been particular instances of deliberately nonsensical research that fits a certain perspective being published. You can take that as a damning indictment against the disciplines where you can do that. Some take it as a critique against peer review in any context. But it doesn't make sense to blanket reject peer-reviewed research as a process unless you have something better. In a misquote of Churchill, it's been said that peer review is the worst of all research systems, except for all the others. Because where else are you going to look? Opinionated blogs and the like, aren't it? Nor even, dare I say, YouTube channels. Basically, the question is whether you give up on the advancement of human understanding because it's a process that moves forward step by step, sometimes one step back and two steps forward, and often has to correct itself in the face of new evidence. Because there's nothing that applies to climate science that doesn't apply to every other science, except for the fact that in most of those others, there aren't people standing, watching every step, waiting to declare it a failure or a fraud. I mean, we have had that in the past, scientists that have been punished harshly for pointing out that the Earth wasn't the centre of the universe or that indeed God wasn't needed in order to explain the universe. It doesn't all go one way. There are valid criticisms that we now have an establishment that's too quick to dismiss the smarter sceptic concerns. But likewise, we have a dementing chorus of cynics waiting for every admission of uncertainty to pounce with simplistic dismissals. We need the research to be able to understand what's going on in the world and peer review is the best mechanism we have to improve its quality. Don't treat it as gold, don't dismiss it as junk. Look to it with curiosity, both open and sceptical. Of course, there is another aspect which is controversial with some. Point five, let's talk about climate models. Oh yes. All of our predictions for what the climate will be like in the future come from computer models. Statistics professor George E.P. Box once wrote, all models are wrong. Some models are useful. The entrenched climate change advocates generally fail to acknowledge the first part of that quote. The entrenched critics and sceptics generally refuse to acknowledge the second part. First, let's have some respect for the complexities involved with trying to model the global climate system. We are trying to do something really difficult. If you look at the actual results rather than the caricatures painted by some, they are producing useful but not flawless results. We expect they will get better over time. At the same time, speaking to the people on the other side, be aware of the limitations and the downsides. There are all sorts of ways these complex systems can mislead you. In his book Loser Think, Scott Adams describes one way that we can be fooled in relation to such models. He describes the stock email scam. And it works like this. Spam emails go out to three large groups of people, each with a different stock prediction. Supposing by chance one out of three of those predictions turns out to be correct. The scammers then split the group that received the correct pr prediction into three, send them three more predictions. One of those turns out to be correct. Finally, they do the same again. Once again, one of the predictions is correct. That then gives you a sizable group that has received three correct predictions in a row. And you go to them and you say, look at this track record. Don't you want to give your investment money to me so you can share in my outstanding success? And you're there and you're thinking to yourself, well, yeah, I've seen it with my own eyes. They made three predictions. They couldn't possibly have known in advance. All three came true. Pretty amazing. Here's my money. And it looks like magic, but only because you don't see all the failed variants that were necessary to make random chance serve up the correct result. Climate models where you discard the ones that don't match historical reality 
can have a similar effect. And just because you're then left with models that do have some correlation with reality doesn't necessarily make them sound predictors of the future. Now, at this point, some of you are nodding your heads and saying, that's right, climate models are a scam. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that they are complex, they are flawed, they are getting better. Right now, their predictions do not and cannot carry the weight of certainty. If you have no experience in science, you may think that climate models created by scientists are science because they're created by scientists. But prediction models are not science. They are intelligent combination of scientific thinking, maths, human judgment and incomplete data. That's why there are lots of different models. All of them a bit different. The fact that they are different is the clue. So all of their predictions should be treated with respect. But to model the full complexity of the climate takes a magnitude of complexity and processing power that is currently beyond us. The UK Met Office recently spent over a billion pounds on a computer to get a couple of steps closer. Because what we have can't handle all that complexity. A number of different phenomena that are much more simply modelled. Inevitably, that introduces room for error. Some people dismiss them as worthless, and I'm sorry, but that's a ridiculous position, born of wishful thinking. They tell us a lot of useful things that we need to know, and actually, that room for error being addressed by all the processing power of the Met Office is more focused on the short-term weather forecasts, where a larger amount of chaos and uncertainty plays out in micro-weather than it does for longer-term changes to the global climate in the face, say, of a 1.5 degree centigrade rise in global temperatures. So those are some thoughts about the mechanics that are often at the heart of the climate change debate. Then there are some specifics about how to think and formulate your own positions and critiques in relation to the scientific approach. So, point six, beware one variable thinking where you decide that one factor explains complex situations. For instance, those who suggest that only CO2 matters when it comes to climate and then get challenged to explain why there is natural variability. There's variability because there are numerous factors at play. It weakens neither side to acknowledge complexity. Indeed, CO2 on its own wouldn't be giving us the range of climate change that is predicted is the presence of additional amplifiers and feedbacks that make the difference. On the other side, the people who say that climate scientists will follow wherever the grant money leads them. This is supposed to provide the unescapable rationale for why there might be a big conspiracy of climate scientists faking the data, or from those that are being a little more kind about it, that there's some kind of massive group think where people don't question some of the fundamental tenets of their area because it's not in their interest to do so. Let's be clear, money does create significant bias in general in society. But it's simplistic and not in keeping with the observed world around us to suggest that it's the only variable you need to come up with a rational opinion on climate science. There is no scientific community in history where nobody questions questionable things. Scientific gatherings are marked by huge arguments about all sorts of ideas and theories. Money and attention started to go into climate science because people realised, starting with that well-known hippie Henry Kissinger, that with world population as large as it is and increasingly dependent on key food crops grown in specific areas, that we had become increasingly vulnerable to changes in climate. Even if we were only talking about the sort of natural changes we've seen in the past, with the Little Ice Age a couple of hundred years ago, there would still be a real need to understand the system better and to predict what will happen next more accurately, and hence the money would go into the area anyway. It isn't the case that interest in that area is dependent on a doomsday scenario being painted in order to keep the cash flowing in. Lots of things motivate scientists. And there's plenty of evidence that profession, as for every other profession, serving society and doing a good job is important and in many cases more important for many than just for money. In the absence of that one variable thinking, the logic that allows you to concoct a scenario of large numbers of people faking the data rather falls away. So then we have to deal with the reality of what the data is or isn't telling us, which, you know, still gives us enough to argue about, let's face it. Point seven, don't get anecdotal evidence mixed up with data. People say things like, I have lived here for 50 years and I've noticed X. Well, good for you. 
But two things are working against you. A, we have plenty of evidence of how utterly unreliable our memories are. And B, the fact that you say that that's your experience is unprovable and unfalsifiable. So let's look instead at something quantifiable. And that means real data. And let's talk about the arguments about what the data means. And finally, point eight, have respect for professionals, for people that studied the subject in depth and then spent their lives working on it. There are complexities in every scientific field. Sometimes there are things that are counterintuitive, in other language, not common sense, but that are nevertheless true. And if you don't believe that, go off and read a book about quantum physics. So this comes into some of the things that people put forward, like suggesting that maybe climate scientists forgot to take account of the sun. The sun is such a big part of all of the aspects of climate science. It's a ridiculous statement. It'd be like suggesting that all of the veterinarians forgot to study dogs. Ah. Don't get me wrong, accepting authority blindly isn't what we're talking about. It's not as though there's never been an instance of people in specialisms becoming arrogant and out of touch and wrong. I mean, that tends to happen. It tends to happen when their expertise is being slavishly pandered to, which maybe was the case for some decades in the past with medical doctors or very least top surgeons, say. I don't think any climate scientist will recognise that as having been their situation over the last couple of decades, really. Which is good, you know, where it's intelligent and constructive, it keeps the thinking sharp. I think we can recognise that there are elements on both sides, again, where intelligent and constructive is not the label we would necessarily use. Anyway, that's all for this time. In part two, we will move on to what I've termed as the spirit of the debate. Is there a better way to engage the argument? I promise you stimulating ideas and thoughtful provocation. Nothing more, nothing less. Join me then. Mm -hmm.